Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. This week, Mississippi leadership is in the spotlight as anti-abortion advocates await a Supreme Court ruling on Dobbs versus the Jackson Women's Health Organization. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, what's next? Journalist Aaron Rupar joins us with his analysis and a baby formula shortage is putting Mississippi mothers under a lot of pressure. We'll hear from Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. The abortion rights debate has put a spotlight on Mississippi's conservative leadership. Governor Tate Reeves himself has once again charged into the national media landscape, defending the state's case for curtailing abortion access as we await a final ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court. The Republican Reeves posted on social media Wednesday about his recent interviews, quote, in the past few days, I've talked to CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox News, Glenn Beck, Ben Shapiro this afternoon. Left and right, lots of hard, sometimes crazy questions on what is often an uncomfortable topic. I think it's necessary. Cannot be afraid to defend our conservative views, end quote. We should note, while Governor Reeves has been very accessible to national media, 12 News has a standing invitation for the governor to talk with us one-on-one -on -one about abortion rights and other issues that matter to Mississippians. But he has yet to agree to that interview with us. So we are left to parse the governor's message via national outlets. And one of the journalists who has been doing just that is Aaron Rupar. He is an independent journalist and author of the news blog Public Notice on Substack. Rupar is formerly an associate editor on politics and policy for Vox.com and a chronicler of conservative politics during and after the Trump presidency. I would say that um, what stood out is that I thought he hinted at where this debate surrounding uh, abortion rights might be going in the future if Roe is indeed overturned. And, you know, he made um, very uh, few, you know, he didn't really try to, to hide the fact that it seems like the next thing that would be on the table was some sort of a plan B ban slash, uh, you know, restricting birth control access. Um, and I thought those comments that he made uh, primarily on CNN, you know, again, kind of indicated where if, you know, reproductive rights becomes more of a state by state issue, uh, that red states like Mississippi might see restrictions implemented, not just with abortion, but with, you know, other rights that people have kind of taken for granted, such as a right to contraception. Yeah, he got he kind of doubled down, though, when he was asked about locally about contraceptives. He's saying that he's not going to go against contraceptives and uh, put a tweet out saying that after this Tapper interview, uh, you think he's got to stick by that? It's hard to say because I think the way that he phrased it in the, the national TV interviews that he did was, you know, not saying that, that, it was, that, that restricting contraception is something that he supported, but not closing the door to signing legislation if, you know, the legislature sends him a bill that would do something like that. So mm -hmm. I was really listening for that. And if it was something that he wasn't going to do, I would have expected him to say, no, I wouldn't sign a bill like that. Um, you know, we're not thinking about that at, at this time or something like that. But it, it seemed like he more was intent on leaving the door open. So, you know, I, I can't, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some blowback that he received and he decided to try and kind of clarify his remarks a little bit. But certainly just going on those interviews last weekend, I thought um, he made it pretty clear that the door was open to those types of things. Reeves is not the only Republican politician pushing the anti-abortion case on TV lately. Talk about Governor Asa Hutchinson in Arkansas, for instance, and what he is talking about on the news circuit. Asa, Asa Hutchinson is on the Sunday shows quite regularly, as is Governor Reeves as well. But uh, Hutchinson, you know, notably is a governor who, as a Republican, goes on and has been uh, quite critical of Trump. During different interviews that he's done, um, he has promoted, uh, you know, COVID public health regulations in a way that a lot of Republicans haven't done lately. And so, um, you know, he's a little bit of a unique character within the Republican Party in that respect. But I thought, again, you know, it was notable that his comments on uh, abortion and birth control, you know, were kind of in the same vein as Governor Reeves, where uh, Asa Hutchinson said during one interview that he did, I believe it was on uh, ABC's This Week, that he supports exceptions in state law for abortion bans for victims of rape and incest. But of course, he signed a bill just last year, a trigger law that made no exceptions for those things. And so, um, you know, I think you kind of, in instances like this, deeds are more import important than words. And, you know, he signed a ban that made no exceptions. And that's also the case, of course, with the Mississippi law. 
So I didn't see a lot of daylight between Reeves and Hutchinson. And of course, they're both governors of very red, deep south states. And so I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of difference. But, you know, they're both governors who preside over states where if Roe is overturned because of those trigger laws that are on the books, uh, you know, abortion will become almost totally banned in both states. So, you know, again, notably, Hutchinson is a guy who goes on these Sunday shows and is kind of an anti-Trump figure within the party. But even he... Um, you know, is pretty far out there, at least based on, you know, in, in comparison with where public opinion is at across the country as a whole, he's pretty far out there on abortion rights. You've written about your view that conservatives are unlikely to settle on a potential overturning to Roe v. Wade. What do you think is next in terms of right-wing policy initiatives? You know, again, uh, one thing that I wrote about over the weekend that I thought is important to take note of is that Mitch McConnell, um, you know, hasn't been slamming the door on the possibility that if Republicans have control of Congress and the presidency in 2025, that they would be interested in at least discussing some sort of national abortion ban. So, um, you know, there's some talk within the Republican Party about the value of basically returning this issue to the states. Um, but I don't think that's going to last that long because i think that if republicans are in a position where they control the federal government again as they did you know between 2017 and 2019 that seems to be something that will at least be a topic of discussion you know whether there should be instead of codifying roe into law as democrats are doing right now kind of taking the opposite approach and implementing some sort of a national ban um, I think the politics of that could get really ugly because, you know, in blue states like California and New York, obviously people are going to be very, very upset over that. But, um, you know, you can kind of see the argument that people like Ted Cruz during TV appearances have already been kind of previewing where they're going to say, you know, for um, the entirety of America's existence up until 1973, reproductive rights were states that were, were issues that were decided by legislatures, including both state and federal legislatures. And, you know, if people elect Republicans, they're going to view that as a mandate to pursue these more, um, you know, to pursue restrictions on reproductive rights. And I think that will also be a debate nationally. So that's something that I'm watching. You know, of course, the first step here is we just need to see what the Supreme Court actually does. Um, we have this leaked draft opinion that would overturn Roe. But of course, it's just a draft. And we're not entirely sure that that's going to be the final ruling that we get, uh, maybe as soon as next month. But, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of that decision. And then I think there will be a lot of political consequences kind of cascading from there. We'll have more with Aaron Rupar when Mississippi Insight continues. A lot of these conservative views do resonate with many voters here in Mississippi and throughout the South, but there's a strong support across the country as a whole for maintaining legal access to abortion. Are conservative leaders such as Governor Reeves likely to gain much ground nationwide uh, for a debate over abortion rights? I don't think so. I mean, polling on this has been very steady. Um, and of course, it kind of depends how you ask people the question. It, it depends if you ask them, should there be any restrictions whatsoever on abortions? What sort of restrictions do you support? Um, you know, from the polling that I've seen, it's been very consistently between about 65% and 70% of people nationally say that they oppose overturning Roe. Um, you know, but Roe is simply the right that, you know, the right that people have to an abortion. And as we have seen, you know, different states regulate that differently, but you can't ultimately infringe on that right. Um, but it's, you know, obviously very difficult in some states to get an abortion, and it's much easier in other states to get an abortion. Um, so there's a lot of variance within that. But I think if we do move towards a national model, whether that's, you know, it, probably through some sort of legislation that Republicans would push where we get a national abortion ban, um, I think that's going to be very problematic politically, because in a lot of states um, that are more liberal with abortion laws, that's going to be very, very unpopular. Whereas obviously, as you were alluding to in Mississippi, Louisiana, states like that, there's more of a political uh, tolerance or appetite for restricting abortion. So I think it's going to depend kind of on, you know, I don't think that this is going to, this is going to be problematic necessarily for Republicans in states like Mississippi and in Louisiana, but in some of these states that are more purple states or swing states like Wisconsin, um, even Texas, Georgia, these states that are trending more blue, um, I think that this could be a political problem for Republicans. And so that's kind of a big, um, you know, I think the most important thing that people should be talking about is just this question of what rights 
uh, what reproductive rights women should have. But beyond that, there is political effects of this as well. And I do think that um, it has a potential, if Roe is overturned, to be kind of a galvanizing force for Democrats heading into the midterms where they can really make a case that, hey, look, we need to get people to vote because rights are under threat. Republicans are trying to take them away. And we need to vote uh, to get more Democrats into federal office so that even if the Supreme Court does overturn Roe, we have enough Democrats to enshrine abortion protections into federal law. In some of these states that are pushing that, they are going to make it against the law for you to go across state lines to get abortion. How is that going to play for Republicans? I think that's going to play very poorly depending on how it's enforced. And, you know, that that's a whole nother can of worms where, um, you know, how these laws are going to be enforced vis-a-vis -vis different, you know, vis-a-vis -vis different states. So, um, you know, for instance, right now when you're talking to me, I'm in Minnesota, but I'm in a region that is very close to Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is one of the states that has a trigger law on the books that would ban abortion. So in the region of Minnesota that I'm in, we will almost certainly have women who come from Wisconsin over here to get abortions. And what will that look like? You know, will they be subject to some sort of prosecution or will it just be the medical providers who will be subject to prosecution? Um, I'm sure some of these details are, are already hammered out in the various trigger laws. Um, that goes a little bit beyond my expertise, but I do think it opens kind of a problematic can of worms where, um, you know, are, are you really going to have kind of like federal agents arresting people if they're crossing state lines for these things? You know, who is going to be punished? Um, you know, are, is this going to be some sort of a murder charge? There's been talk of that, you know, that it would be some a form of homicide in Louisiana. There's a, you know, a measure, a bill that's advancing through the legislature there that would basically enshrine that into law. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, when the rubber meets the road and we're actually seeing instances where women are falling into legal trouble because of this, or doctors are, um, I think there will be some pretty harrowing stories that will obviously have political impacts. Um, you know, that could be bad for Republicans, but you know, it's kind of scary to think that we would even get there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if it is kind of a worst case scenario in that, in that respect, I think that, you know, there will be some pretty, um, there will be very dramatic political consequences of that. When we talk about top election issues, is it going to be inflation or is it going to be abortion? Who wins on what issue here? I think it'll be both a little bit. You know, I, I do think that um, certainly the White House, I mean, I was listening just before we uh, started doing this interview to President Biden, who's speaking today in Illinois, and he, in the last two or three days, has been very insistent that he wants to talk about the economy. He wants to talk about how the White House is fighting inflation. He doesn't want to talk about abortion rights. And, you know, I've seen a lot of criticism of Biden for that, but I think part of it at this stage is that, again, we don't have the final decision. So, you know, there, there is kind of a norm in which it's inappropriate for presidents to be weighing in on cases that are before the Supreme Court. So I think, you know, Biden being kind of the traditionalist that he is, he's trying to sort of respect those boundaries. Um, but I think it'll be both. And I think that um, you will have a lot of women. I mean, we saw it, you know, after Trump's election in early 2017, when, when there was the Women's March and how big of an event that was in D.C. People came from all over the country to, you know, march in protest of Trump and in support of women's rights, including reproductive rights. And, it, you know, and then in 2018, we saw obviously a huge wave election where Democrats took control of the House. Um, but, you know, I think any election comes down to many different factors, and the economy is certainly a big problem for Democrats right now, given that they are in power and that people who don't follow politics as close as you and I do um, kind of engage in that form of analysis where if you're in power and things aren't going well, you get blamed and people vote for change. So um, I wouldn't make the prediction that, you know, abortion rights becomes like the top issue and leads to a, a wave election. I think the economy will be a headwind that Democrats will face that might, you know, negate some of the perception that's out there that they are the party of reproductive rights and women's rights. Um, so I guess the answer that I would give you to that question is both. Um, and I would, you know, it seems like, and maybe at this point, they would be kind of canceling out each other to some extent, because I think a lot of the people who are going to uh, be really galvanized by this reproductive rights issue might be feeling kind of discouraged by um, the, the perception that the economy isn't doing well and that inflation's gotten worse under Biden and things like that. So there's going to be a lot of different factors that people, uh, you know, that people use when, you know, a lot of factors that they take into account when they're voting. And, you know, it'd be hard to disentangle them at this point. Governor Reese is no stranger to tough questions on such things as voting rights, as handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and other critical topics. What do you think explains uh, Mississippi governor's eagerness to get on national TV shows to press his case here? Is he simply positioning himself for something bigger? 
That's a really great question because he is a guy who is on the Sunday shows quite regularly. It seems like he's on CNN at least three or four times a year. Um, I'll see him on there. And that's really kind of my only visibility into Tate Reeves is um, seeing him on national TV. I mean, of course, I'll read news reports here and there about things that are going on in Mississippi, but I mainly know him through his appearances on CNN. And um, I would be pretty hard pressed to see him winning nationwide office. Um, although, you know, I could see him maybe running for, for U.S. Senate, something like that. Because, you know, I think part of the problem is with this most recent interview that he did, and this has been a problem repeatedly for him, is that, you know, he's out there on CNN saying that, you know, sure, there aren't any exceptions for rape and incest for this abortion law that we have. But, you know, we're going to make sure that we invest uh, to make sure that women, you know, and mothers have the resources they need, whether that's you know, in their own families or to put kids up for adoption, things like that. But the fact of the matter is Mississippi, um, going back, you know, many decades now has ranked towards the bottom of, you know, quality of life for children. Um, and so I don't really see any reason why people would believe that just because Roe is overturned, that suddenly that's going to change or that it will become more of a priority for state lawmakers in Mississippi to really invest in families and kids. And so I think he kind of opens himself up to attacks that are pretty um, easy to make um, because the record doesn't really the record doesn't really match his rhetoric on issues like reproductive rights. Um, but I will say, you know, I, I do give him a, a small amount of credit for at least being willing to go on national TV and defend um, the policies that he supports in Mississippi and nationally because. As I pointed out in my newsletter, um, there were no Republican members of Congress, with the exception of Nancy Mace, who went on the Sunday shows this week to even defend uh, restricting abortion rights. So at least he and Governor Hutchinson uh, in Arkansas, at least give them credit for being willing to go on TV and take tough questions and try to defend what they're doing, even if I do think their defenses kind of fall short. As we record this, the U.S. Senate is taking up a bill to preserve abortion rights. It is likely to fail, given the math in the Senate. Do Democrats have any recourse to a potential overturning of Roe other than getting their supporters out to vote in November? Well, you know, the, the thing that I will say that even today that Joe Manchin was talking about with this bill that is before the Senate is that um, I think it goes too far for moderates who maybe support abortion rights but, you know, are opponents of late-term abortion or this notion that, you know, women can get abortion on demand. They don't like that, and they would like to see more restrictions than this current bill on offer before the Senate. So I guess I could, in theory, see there being a bill that was a little bit more restrictive than the one the Senate is voting on that could get um, some more supporters. Now, I don't know if that would be enough support to either reach the 60-vote threshold or to get 50 senators on board with changing the filibuster rules for legislation like that. Um, and I haven't heard much talk of any legislation beyond the bill that is going to be voted upon this week that will be voted down or, you know, it won't have the, the enough votes to overcome a filibuster, basically. Um, so I do think that we're probably looking at a scenario where this is going to be on the ballot in November. And, you know, if Republicans take back both the House and Senate, there could start to be talk of some sort of national ban. And, you know, really, uh, Democrats would need either, you know, two more senators who are on board with changing the filibuster rules, which doesn't seem like too tall of an order, or you would have to get, you know, roughly 10 Republican senators on board in the Senate to vote for some sort of reproductive rights bill uh, that could then overcome a filibuster. So there's a lot of moving parts right now, but my sense of the state of play is that there probably won't be any big action uh, in terms of legislation between now and the midterms. And so it's really going to come down to what the balance of Congress looks like starting next January. Up next, words of warning for the state's Ag and Commerce Commissioner on the baby formula shortage. It's Mississippi Insight, only on WJTV. A state senator from South Haven got some direct experience with Jackson crime last week. Senator Kevin Blackwell says that this pickup truck was stolen while he was having dinner with his wife at Walker's Drive-In in Fondren. Blackwell's white GMC Sierra was stolen from the parking lot. Security video shows that the two thieves are breaking into the truck and then taking off. Blackwell also says that he had two handguns inside his truck when it was stolen. The shortage of baby formula continues to worsen for many families. 12 News' Tal Ta spoke with Agriculture and Commerce Commissioner Andy Gibson about the shortage. 
Navigating the nationwide shortage of baby formula has become an added stressor for parents. Recent data by the firm Data Assembly shows during the first week of May, the average out-of-stock rate for baby formula at retailers was 43%. Families are going to get through it. But not for the next couple of months, experts say. Adding the ongoing shortage of infant formula is tied to a number of factors that include recalls, inflation and supply chain problems. Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce, Andy Gibson, reminds Finding folks to buy what you need. I encourage people to, you know, when you can buy it, buy enough. Don't don't raid the shelves. In the meantime, experts advise against making your own formula at home and to consult with your pediatrician. Well, officials say that the Food and Drug Administration is working to ramp up production to get more baby formula on store shelves. We'll be back in a moment. Big thanks to journalist Aaron Rupar for joining us this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown. From all of us here at 12 News, make it a great weekend.